Well, good morning, all. I want to ask you to open up your Bibles with me this morning to two passages of Scripture, one from the Old and then one from the New Testaments. The first passage we'll be looking at is 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20 will be towards the end of that chapter when we, when we dive in there. 1 Samuel chapter 20. And then a little bit later, we're going to be in Matthew 26. So right now, 1 Samuel 20, a little bit later, Matthew 26. On the 1st of February, 1942, the U.S. aircraft carrier Enterprise was off the Marshall Islands where an attack had been made, one of the first after Pearl Harbor, where the U.S. was able to attack back at the Empire of Japan. Now, while this was going on, five Japanese twin-engine bombers, large bombers, were able to get through the Enterprise's defenses and miraculously dropped their ordnance but missed hitting the Enterprise. They turned around and were heading back to their base, but the lead Japanese bomber had been so damaged by anti-aircraft fire that the pilot determined he couldn't make it back to his base on the Marshall Islands. And so he determined to turn back around again and turn his twin-engine bomber, this, this large airplane, into a flying bomb and to ram it into the deck of the USS Enterprise, therefore taking out one of America's few aircraft carriers, precious aircraft carriers at that time. Now everyone on deck at the Enterprise recognized what was happening as the bomber turned and as the bomber started heading directly for them. They trained all their air, anti-aircraft um, uh, weapons on that uh, bomber coming in, but none of it was effective. And the bomber kept getting closer and closer and closer to impact on the flight deck and, and, and total destruction for, for the aircraft carrier and everyone on deck. It was at that moment when aviation machinist mate third class Bruno Guido leapt up from the catwalk, ran across the flight deck, jumped into the rear seat of a dauntless two-seat bomber that the Navy had parked there on the flight deck. That was his normal uh, station, battle station there, the, the, the second seat of that aircraft. That second seat was the gunner's seat. And he took the twin machine gun, 30 caliber machine gun, and calmly and coolly faced down the Japanese bomber heading straight for him and was able to train accurate fire on the cockpit of that aircraft. The aircraft kept getting closer and closer and Bruno Guido kept shooting at it accurately. At the very last minute, his fire caused that aircraft to veer off to the side. It didn't hit the flight deck directly, but hit the deck a glancing blow and creamed off into the water, saving the Enterprise, saving everyone who was on the ship that day. The bomber, the Japanese bomber, came so close that it actually took off the tail of the airplane that Bruno Guido had jumped into. So it goes by, the deck is saved, the ship is saved. Bruno Guido stands up, takes the uh, fire extinguisher that's in the cockpit with him, calmly hops down and puts out a deck fire that this collision has, has, uh, has created. And then, and only then, at that moment, does Bruno Guido uh, panic. He panics because he's afraid he's going to be reprimanded for leaving his watch station during the battle. <laughs> so he runs down into the bowels of the ship, Vice Admiral William Halsey, who, like everyone else, was holding his breath as that Japanese bomber was coming into the flight deck, demands that this young sailor be found. 
The ship is searched. Bruno Guido is found, and he is brought upstairs to see the old man. And there, in the presence of the vice admiral, machinist mate third class Bruno Guido is promoted to machinist mate first class Bruno Guido. Now that young man, in a moment of crisis, uh, set aside, you know, the, the self-preservation that, that any one of us would have felt in that moment. And for love of country, for love of the freedoms that our country possesses, but perhaps in that moment, mostly for love of his fellow sailors, he ran across the freight deck, put himself in the direct path of that bomber and took it out. It is appropriate this morning as we go through Scripture, taking a look at individuals, individuals really not much different than us, that the Lord has used, uh, whose lives we see depicted in Scripture, that this Memorial Day weekend, we take a look at an individual who did not count his life precious, but put the will of God before his own. This individual is an often overlooked character in the story of David. This is the story of Jonathan, son of the first king of Israel, King Saul. Now, as we take a look at Jonathan and his actions, we will see that in the life of Jonathan, God is helping us to look forward to the, the true hero of history, Jesus the Messiah who would come. But first, let us take a look at Jonathan. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 20. We are going to parachute down into the midst of the action here in verse 30. So 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. Well, we hopped right into the kind of climax of Jonathan's story here. To get it in full context, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit and, and set the stage here. At this point in the history of God's people, the Israelites, they were undergoing a massive transition, a transition uh, under the, uh, that began under the leadership of the judges that God would raise up during the time of the judges to the rise of the monarchy in the nation of Israel. And it was a bumpy transition, to say the least. The um, time of the judges was the time that we were looking at a few months back uh, when we looked at the story of Ruth. Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, they all lived during the time of the judges. The time of the judges uh, also depicted in the book by that same name. It was a time where God was the leader of his people, uh, but they would fall away from him and get themselves in trouble. And then they would cry out to the Lord and he would raise up for them a leader called a judge. And the judge would, would, would judge uh, court cases and so forth. But the judge would also judge the situation the people were in and would help uh, deliver them through the power of Almighty God. The, the last of these judges, and, and, and the greatest really of, of all of them, was Samuel. And we saw the beginning of Samuel's story back on Mother's Day when we took a look at the life of Hannah, Samuel's mother, and her great prayer to the Lord a uh, prayer that the Lord answered. Well, Samuel grew up to be a very, very powerful judge, a, a powerful leader of Israel, a prophet, one that everyone respected. Uh, and, and Samuel is leading now the people of Israel, and he's an older man. 
And the people of Israel are looking at him and his sons weren't quite up to Samuel's standards. And they're saying, Samuel, when you're gone, we're going to need somebody. We need a king. We're looking around at all the other nations around us and they have a king and they have these armies that, that the king can lead into battle. And, and we need somebody like, like that. And Samuel is, is, is very hurt and angered by this. But God speaks to Samuel and he says, Samuel, the people are not rejecting you when they ask for a king. They are rejecting me, their one true king, God Almighty. So here's what I want you to do, Samuel. I want you to tell them what a king is going to do, and then I want you to anoint for them the king they want. And so Samuel does this. He goes before the gathered people, and he says, here's what a king is going to do. A king is going to take your sons to build out his army. A king is going to take your daughters to occupy his palace. A king is going to take your harvest and your money to pay for the housing and feeding of your sons and daughters that he took earlier. You get the common denominator there, what a king's going to do? A king's going to take. The implication here is that as God is king of the people, God doesn't take, God gives. But the people say, no, we want a king. And so God identifies and then Samuel anoints the king that they want. He is a man by the name of Saul and he looks every bit of king. He comes straight from central casting. He is head and shoulders above every other man in the kingdom, literally. He is really tall, big-shouldered, the kind of guy you want leading you into battle. Now Saul is anointed king, becomes the first king of Israel. Saul is a complicated individual, and God's relationship with Saul is complicated as well. Sometimes it doesn't make on first reading of the account a whole lot of sense, but given the entirety of Saul's life, as is depicted in 1 Samuel, we, we begin to see some common themes in Saul's character. First off, Saul's a bully. Unless, of course, the pressure's on him, then Saul's a coward. Saul has this veneer of religiosity that he has around him, but at his core, he has no true faith in the God of Israel. The religion is a show for him. Okay, it is a defense almost. That's the individual that they have as king. And it takes the people a while to recognize this. God, of course, knows it from the beginning. Saul crosses the line with God relatively early on in his kingship. Um, God has granted to him the task of being king, which is military leader of the people of Israel. When uh, They don't have a standing army, but, but he calls the army together when need uh, approaches. Uh, and need is approaching at this particular time, and, and Saul gathers the army of Israel together, and he holds them there, and he's waiting for Samuel to show up to offer the sacrifices to the Lord to ask his blessing be upon the army. And Samuel doesn't show up at the appointed time, and Saul is sorely tempted. It's his job to lead the people militarily, it's Samuel's job to intercede before God for the people. But Saul threatened with the people drifting away, the army drifting away as he waits. He takes it upon himself to offer up the sacrifices in the place of God's person, uh, Samuel, to, to, to do that. He assumes that responsibility. He crosses the line. And God says to Saul through the prophet Samuel, I was going to establish your kingdom and your reign forever. But because you have usurped the kingdom of the one true king, I will take it from you and give it to a man after my own heart. Now, while this is happening, while we see Saul failing, we also are given a view of Saul's son, Jonathan. And Jonathan is our person of interest this morning, okay? Jonathan is different than Saul. 
Most of us know the story of David and Goliath, right? David, the, the young boy who goes out and faces the giant of the Philistine army and does so because that, that giant has the temerity, the, 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 the audacity, if you will, to, uh, to confront the army of the one true God. And so uh, David you know, goes out and does that in the, in the power and strength of, of God. Um, but we see Jonathan actually doing this kind of thing even before David shows up on the scene. Jonathan and his armor bearer, two guys, knowing that the Lord is with them, they rush out and attack a garrison of Philistine soldiers, and Jonathan single-handedly kills 20 of them, causing a rout. The soldiers flee. This sends panic throughout the ranks of the Philistine army. And he does this because he knows that the one true God is with him. So if we don't know about David yet and we're reading the story, or if we're living during this time under the reign of King Saul, we know Saul has got his issues. However, everything's going to be okay because Jonathan comes next. He's going to be the next king. And this is a guy who fears the Lord but doesn't fear anything else. He is a guy that's going to be a true righteous king for us. However, God's not going to make Jonathan king. God sends Samuel to the town of Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. And he says, Samuel, go to Jesse's house and anoint the man I show you, one of Jesse's sons, to be the next king of Israel. Samuel goes. He goes to Jesse's house. He sees Jesse's firstborn son, and boy, he looks the part. He's tall. He's got the big shoulders, all that. Samuel says, okay, this is the guy. And God says, no, that's not the guy. Samuel, you're looking on the outside. I look on the heart. And Samuel goes down the line looking at all of Jesse's sons. They're all rejected by God. Finally, Samuel says, you got anybody else? And Jesse says, well, only the, only the run of the litter. He's out there watching the sheep. Send for him. David comes. God says, this is the one. Samuel anoints him king. Shortly thereafter, David goes to bring some refreshments to his brothers who are fighting in Saul's army. And the Philistine giant is there on the field. And David can't stand it. And he goes and defeats uh, Goliath. And now David starts to rise in influence and power. Saul brings him into the court. David becomes a general. He leads armies. His renown grows and grows and grows and grows. It becomes apparent to everybody God's hand is on David. David is the future. Saul is rapidly becoming the past. How does Saul react to this? Saul is jealous. Saul is scared. And he thinks to himself, if I get rid of David, all my problems go away. And so he begins to connive and conspire to kill David. Jonathan's in the same boat, right? Jonathan is next in line to be king. But David's popularity and renown and glory is eclipsing his as well. Jonathan faces the same dilemma that Saul does. David and Jonathan become friends because they are so much alike. They both fear the Lord and really nothing else. Um, they, are, they are kindred spirits. David pulls Jonathan inside and says, Look, your dad wants me dead. And Jonathan, as you can imagine, is very conflicted here. He has conflicting loyalties. He has his friend David who is really their kindred spirits and they both, both love the Lord. And, and Jonathan is, is, is figuring out that that, that, that God's plan goes through David. But you also have Jonathan's father, Saul, who also happens to be king of Israel. And there are certain loyalties that lie there as well. Uh, Jonathan, as you can see, is, is, is really caught in a hard place. He is in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? But he is a harbinger of the, the great hero who is to come, the, the hero of history, the hero of the universe, 
Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that hero is declared to us at the next passage that we're going to turn to. That's Matthew chapter 26. Turn with me there. Matthew chapter 26, we're going to pick up about halfway through in, in verse 36. So Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Verse 38. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, and for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if it cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus, God himself, one of the Trinity, the Son to the Father and the Spirit, came to earth on a rescue mission to his own detriment. And there he sits at the crisis point of his ministry and his life in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he cries out to the Father, Father, please don't make me go through this. Don't make me be arrested and tried and shamed and storned and stripped naked and tortured and nailed to a cross for all to see and to die in agony. Let that cup pass from me, is his prayer. But that's just the first part of his prayer. The second part of his prayer is even more powerful. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He doesn't put himself first. He puts all of us first. Now, we may think by that point the die was cast, but the die was not cast. If we continue reading, which we'll do here, we'll see that Jesus, he had options. Verse 47, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, the one that I kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then he came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have, I come out, uh, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has to take place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Jesus, did you catch it? He had some options here. He could have imposed his own will on the situation. He could have called for heavenly legions to come to his defense, to set him up as king. 
he could seize the crown and put it on his head like a Napoleon. But that was not the will of the Father. It was not the reason he came. He came to do something much more critical than that. He came to die as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, for your sins, for my sins. He came to lay down his life and to pick his life back up again, as Scripture tells us. He came to die, ushering in victory over sin, and to rise again, bringing in victory over death and hell. And this victory he will impart to those who take on his name, who put their faith in him. So he could have seized anything he desired. Yet, setting all that aside, he followed the plan of God Almighty and saved all of us. Now, I would love to sit here today and tell you that aviation machinist mate first class, Bruno Guido, returned home after victory in the Pacific was assured and was greeted in his hometown with a victory parade and was celebrated and so forth. And, and that he, he married his high school sweetheart and had children and then was able to years later place his grandchildren on his knee and tell them potentially exaggerated stories about what he did during the war. I would love I would also love to tell you that I don't have allergies, <laughs> but, but I do. I would love to tell you that that was the case with Bruno Guido, but it, but it wasn't. A few short months after his heroics on the flight deck of the Enterprise, Bruno Guido was in the back seat of, of, of that two-seater uh, bomber. Um, the Dauntless, uh, during the Battle of Midway. And um, he's, you know, returning fire at the, the zeros that are, that are coming down on and, and firing on, on uh, their bomber. Uh, the, their, their bomber was hit. The, the pilot in the front seat was able to land the plane on the Pacific so that they survived. They were in a life raft for a period of time. And then they saw a ship on the horizon and the ship saw them. But the problem was the ship belonged to the Empire of Japan, and they were picked up by the naval forces of the Empire of Japan, and they were tortured for two weeks, but they had no critical information to give up. And then Bruto Guido had weights tied to his legs, and he was tossed overboard into the Pacific. Bruno Guido was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he desired to be a part of something greater than himself. And he was. That same empire that tied the weights to his legs and tossed him into the ocean, they lost the war. They lost the war at least in part due to his actions on the flight deck of the Enterprise saving one of the precious and critical aircraft carriers in the Pacific. And they lost the war, no doubt, due to thousands of other selfless actions by countless other unnamed servicemen and women during that war. And they lost the war because it is the will of God for evil to be defeated and for a broken empire to have a second chance. All of that was tied up in the way he lived his life. I would love to tell you that Jonathan lived out his days sharing war stories with his buddy David. I would love to tell you that Jonathan got to, you know, dandle his, uh, his uh, grandchildren on his knee, but, but he didn't. He 
fought alongside his, well, kind of rotten dad, and they were defeated. And their bodies were mutilated on the battlefield to disgrace them. This is how Jonathan ended. He was, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. However, he desired to be a part of something much, much greater. And when he saw the hand of God at work, he not only didn't interfere, he allowed himself to be used by God to bring about not Jonathan's kingdom, but God's kingdom. My friends, if we are to follow Jesus Christ, we are called to do the same thing. We are called to take the crowns off of our heads because it's not about us and serving our kingdom, our will, etc., the things that we want. It's about being a part of what God is doing so that when the church needs someone to show up and open the door and turn the lights on and no one else can be found, but we can do that. We come and do that. When there is an aged parent that needs to be taken care of, and we're the only person who can do that, we do that because they're created in the image of God and because it is godly to do that. We set aside our desires and our needs and so forth to serve someone else in his name. When we greet people at the door here, when we are telling our children and our grandchildren about the eternal faith, even when they brush it off, as, as children can sometimes like to do, we are doing the hard thing that God has called us to do, being a part of something greater than ourselves. It's not the kingdom of Todd. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of God. And when I set aside my desire and will, I become a part of something so much greater. And you guys know this too. There, no doubt, are some of us who are gathered here this morning, in this room, in the virtual room, via the live stream, that have never known being a part of the kingdom of heaven before, being a part of something so much greater than ourselves that we recognize that we were trapped in our own will before we became a part of this greater thing. That is on offer to you today. We have the biblical example of Jonathan. He is someone who would not put himself in front of the work of the Lord. And he was courageous. We can be courageous as well and ask the Lord to do that for us, to make us his, to forgive us of our wrongdoings, to impart to us eternal life beginning now and the gift of his spirit that will make us more like him each and every day. That can be asked for this very day. What else can be asked for this very day is the will to not to enforce our will on our lives, but once again, follow the Lord and his calling. Those of us who have known the Lord for quite a while, we, we can sometimes get tired to think maybe we have done our part already and the church doesn't need someone to turn the lights on. I've already done that. Or the church doesn't need someone to write notes of encouragement to someone else. I've already done that. The church doesn't need this, doesn't need that. Well, do we really want to be excluded from acting as a part, a critical part of something so much greater than ourselves? Why would we want to put ourselves in that position? And so that's the question for us this morning. If we have been following the Lord for a while and if we've gotten fatigued or so forth, and, and, and putting aside our desires for the desires of others. My friends, we are called to such a higher calling. It's a calling to be a part of the kingdom of God. God is at work today like he was at work back then, and he desires us to be a part of it in small ways, like the ways I have mentioned. Being a part of a small group Bible study, walking alongside fellow believers, sharing the faith over the fence, over the fence, excuse me, with, with, a, with a neighbor, um, praying for a coworker. These small things, they add up, and God uses them all as a part of his victory 
over all the enemies of humankind. That's what we've been called to be a part of. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for creation, but we also thank you for sacrifice. We thank you for an imperfect model of sacrifice that we see in the life of Jonathan, a guy in the wrong place at the wrong time, but who ultimately did not allow that to come in between him and you. Dear Lord, we see that in our Savior, Jesus Christ, the perfect hero of history. Dear Lord, please help us to take on his name, Christians. Please help us to follow his perfect example. Dear Lord, please help us to rejoice in being bought by him into something so much greater than ourselves, your kingdom, Lord. Dear Lord, help us not to tire in doing good works, but help us instead to rise up on wings like eagles, serving you, serving people around us in small little ways that add up to big things over time. And dear Lord, if you put us into big situations, we pray for the courage and wisdom to set aside our desires and to follow you in those as well. Dear Lord, we pray you'd be with those who have not trusted their lives to you yet. And we pray that you would reach out to them today and that you would call them to be a part of what you are doing in all of eternity. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.